Part of my trip to Japan is taking their high-speed rail, known as the Shinkansen. We took the Shinkansen from Tokyo to Kyoto. I had a great experience. The seat and restroom are amazingly clean, and I got to enjoy some beautiful countryside view of Japan. Despite the fact that they were passing by very very quickly, I took a couple of photos and did a painting of it. So today I want to share with you some basic tips on taking photos when you are riding a vehicle and the process of my painting. Hey, this is Eric from Cafe Watercolor. If you are going on a trip to anywhere in the world, chances are you are going to ride a transportation. And have you ever spotted a beautiful view that passed you by in a few seconds that you wish you could paint? This happens to me all the time, especially during a long-distance road trip. Because the routes between cities are usually countryside with natural sceneries like rivers, mountains, and big open lands and skies. Not everyone lives near nature. And even though the place I live has a lot of trees and natural sceneries, a big open field that I can see from a distance is still hard to come by. That was especially true when I was in Japan. My first week in Japan is in Tokyo, which is a very dense, busy city. So when we took Shinkansen away from Tokyo, I started to see big open lands and greeneries. It was like a breath of fresh air. So I sat next to the window and started taking pictures. And I realized that I never shared with you how I took these photos for painting references. So even though this might seem a bit just like common sense, I realized there's no harm in sharing. So here they are. Number one, stick your camera to the window as close as possible. When you are riding a vehicle, especially a train, there are likely going to be reflections from inside of the train. So by moving your camera as close to the window as possible, you eliminate the reflection of your surrounding. Now, if you're able to open the window, that would be great. Just be careful not to lose your camera, your phone, or your hands. Also, sometimes the windows you are sitting next to are not the cleanest. So by sticking your camera very close, your camera lens will not focus on the dirt and grimes on the windows and will focus on the actual views. Number two, zoom in if possible. I mentioned multiple times that the camera lenses on our phone are often too wide, which makes them more versatile because you can stay close to a subject and still include a decent amount of surrounding in your photo. However, when you are on a train or a car cruising along the interstate highway or something, you are often very far away from the subject you want to take. While you might not feel that way when you look out with your own eyes, your camera lenses, especially your smartphone lens, will capture much more view than your vision. The scale doesn't look as believable. So you want to zoom in when you take the photos. If your camera or smartphone doesn't have zoom lens, always remember to crop it afterwards. Sometimes I crop my reference photos even after I took the photo zoomed in. And number three, start early and take multiple photos. Because you're moving so fast, you will likely miss the shot if you only start shooting after you see a good view. By the time you pull out your camera, turn it on, and get the right setting, the view you want to capture is probably miles behind you. So unless you know the route so well, you know exactly when to take the photo, you want to get your camera ready. Start taking photo when you see the view is coming to you. Take multiple shots, you can pick out the best one later. Lastly, just a friendly reminder, don't try to take photo while driving. This should go without saying, but I am really tempted to do that from time to time, and that's very dangerous. Sure, you might end up with a scenery photo to die for, pun intended, but it's not worth it. So let's take a look at the process of this painting. It's from one of the photos I took during the ride. I found this a very relaxing and peaceful view of the countryside. Upon a closer look, I realized that it's a rice farm. So without further ado, let's take a look at the process of this painting. Okay, so let's take a look at the process of this painting. Now this is a simple painting because the scenery itself doesn't really have a lot of different elements. Just the sky, the mountain, the field, and some buildings. 
Now, obviously, the building is going to be the most complex stuff, but it's not a huge part of the painting, so it's relatively easier. So I block out the shape very, very quickly. I leave a little bit more room for the sky because the sky is really beautiful. And I also really want to give the people the sense of open air and open sky. That being said, there's still a very basic perspective involved. I use a very basic one point perspective to make everything easier. So here I start to draw the silo and the barn, the house. So I start off with a very typical rectangular box with a triangular prism on top. It gets a little bit complex when it involves multiple different buildings. But if you have some basic knowledge of drawing primitives in perspective, how to make them connect together, how to create different modulation, you should have no problem drawing this. And now you probably noticed that my composition changed a little bit compared to the photo. I make the building a little bit bigger. So in a way, I crop the image just a little. I crop out some extra space on the right. So compared with the photo, the houses and the silo appears to be a little bit closer. So that feels a little bit more intimate without making the house too big. So you can still feel the vastness of the field. You can still feel the openness of the sky, but you don't feel so far away from the scenery. I find that a little bit more engaging to look at for the viewer compared to making everything really small and far away. So after finishing the drawing, we're going to start the first wash. Now for the first wash, I use the biggest brush and pre-wet some part of the sky because I do want some soft cloud, but I leave some dry areas because I still want some hard edges for the cloud. So we can have some soft clouds and some, so we can have some soft clouds and some clouds with a little bit more definitions. So after pre-wetting, I start to paint the blue sky. Now do keep in mind that because the paper is already wet, you need to take that into consideration. If your mixture is too watery, it's going to end up too light. So take the wetness of the paper into consideration and mix your mixture accordingly. So in this case, I mix a little bit thicker than my usual first wash mixture so that the color will be able to be a little bit more present when it's dry. And even I try to compensate that after it's dry, the sky is still going to look somewhat light. But it is a bright sky, so it doesn't really matter. And now I start to paint some dark side of the cloud with a little bit of alizarin crimson, some burnt umber, some cobalt blue. And it's important to understand that you want to finish all this before it is dry especially the way I try to paint cloud, I usually want to leave them kind of loose and transparent and soft. If the wash is dry, you're going to end up with hard edges. A little bit of hard edges are fine, but I don't want too much of that for the background. Now I continue down to the horizon area and I leave some random highlights to hint the buildings in the background. And I started to give it some green tone to the background. Since this is the first wash, we are painting the color of the sky. And also the building itself. Now the rooftop are pretty light, but there's still a little bit of color in it. It's not pure white. So a little bit of color is fine. And we quickly continue the wash. We want to have a nice, consistent, clean wash. Since we are not painting any sort of structure right now, if the color bleed into each other, that's totally fine. Now I'm painting some color of the rice field. So my go-to mixture for the green is copal turquoise 
with either Henson Yellow Deep, or if I want it to be warmer, I will use some orange. So like the warmer part of the rice field on the left, I'm actually using a little bit of orange just to make the green a bit warmer. Adding some soft shapes, wet onto wet, so a little bit of dry brushing. This can add to some textures to the rice field, but just a little bit is fine, don't do too much. And now I make some cooler color and start to paint the mountains in the distance. So I start off with the middle. I soften the edges on the left with some clean water. So it will look like the mountain fades into the atmosphere in the background. And I continue the shape to the right. And now we're getting close to the middle value. So as the mountain getting closer to the viewer, the color become more intense and a little bit warmer. Now the mountains in the photo is a little bit cooler. They're a little bit more blue, but I actually want to make the mountain a little bit greener in my painting, just so that this won't feel as disconnected. So from left, really far into the distance, to the right, it gets darker and warmer. And I start to paint the distant buildings. And when I'm painting those, I don't really think about building all that much. They're just shapes. So I preserve some of the highlights and paint a little bit of middle value shape underneath the highlight. And then immediately you start to think of them as distant buildings with rooftop that get lit by the sun. And it's that easy. That's the power of visual language. A simple contrast in the right context, it can be very self-explanatory for the viewers. Continue this wash to the right. And I start to paint the silo. It's mostly bluish color, but because of the outside has a little bit of rust, so I added some warm kind of red dirt color while it is still wet. So we can have that kind of soft, rusty color. And I continue to wash to the right. And I decided to paint over the rooftop as well because I know that the color is going to fade to a little bit lighter. And I don't want the rooftop to be too bright. It's not really that white. So I just paint over all of them. I continue to wash. Little hints of the details in the distance. And I feel like the grass color is a little bit weak, so I go over it again. Just to make that green more intense. It is a sunny day and under the sun, those green are actually very vibrant. So I continue to give this another layer. And now the color looks nice and rich. And now I'm switching to a smaller brush and make some darker mixture and start to paint the dark value. Starting with the background, just a couple more hints of details in the distant buildings. And very quickly, I start to work my way into the main building. A little bit of a dark occluded shadow and some dark details, especially under the roof and give it a little bit of thickness of the concrete slab. So right under the roof, I start to paint some dark value and immediately with the contrast, you were able to see the direction of the light and the building, the houses become much more solid and three dimensional. Now I don't want it to look too stiff, so I still leave just tiny little bit of space sparkle and random highlights. So the side of the building, 
add a dark to the wall. And I also try to switch the color around, have a little bit darker red. And now here I add some turquoise, some greener color to it. So the roof color for the right building is actually green. So I actually paint that in. The value is a little bit different. And now zoom back out. The house look much more completed. And with some dark value in, the painting now has full range of value and it start to look more finished. And here is just little details, the electric poles, little touches of details make this look a little bit more refined. A few marks to suggest the thickness of the rice field. Now we don't need to paint individual ear of rice. That's going to be too much non-necessary detail. So just a few marks to suggest the thickness of the rice field is enough. We just need to suggest the volume. Couple more dark detail and there we have it. It's a relatively simple painting, but every time I see this type of view during a road trip, it always got me thinking. We only see this view for a couple of seconds, but some people work there or even live there their entire life. Whenever I go on a road trip, I see numerous this type of barns, farmhouse and fields, but each feels like there's a story there. The person who lives here or works here might never see this painting, but it's very relaxing and enjoyable to paint. So hopefully I brought some meaning to this simple scene. Hope you enjoy another slice of my trip and I hope the tips I shared today will be helpful for your next road trip. By the way, my signature brush sets with Craftable are completely sold out. Thank you so much for your support. I am super grateful. All right, that's it for this video. If you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell icon. Also follow me on Instagram for more frequent update and new paintings. I am Eric from Cafe Watercolor. Wish you a wonderful day wherever you are. I will see you next time.